Hello, my name is Michael Roberts, and today I will be finding the impulse response and graphing h of omega and the angle of h of omega. Uh, today we are given a input-output pair, the input being e to the negative 2t, u of t, and the output being uh, the quantity of e to the negative 2t minus e of negative 3t, u of t. Now first, uh, we're asked to find the impulse uh, response, which that is just simply h of t. But we're going to go through a little, uh, almost shortcut. I don't know what you would respond, uh, what, what you would uh, classify this as. But we're going to find what h of omega is first, since we'll have to use that later. And omega is just simply, uh, omega, like h of omega is just simply h of s, big h of s, uh, with s evaluated at j omega. So that's pretty simple, especially with the uh, input-output relation we have today. The same holds true whenever doing a Fourier transform. That's where we get the omega from. Uh, whenever doing the Fourier transform, is the convolution in the t domain is multiplication in the, uh, in the omega domain. So we can say that y of omega is equal to h of omega times x of omega which this can also imply that at, at h of omega is just simply y of omega over x of omega. So we're going to solve that today. Uh, when we look at the first function, let's consider y of t. And if we want to go to the uh, omega domain, uh, we can just ignore the u of t because he only shifts our uh, value. But because he shifts it by zero, it's like he shifted it. Literally, he shifts it by nothing. So let's just consider each individual thing by itself because the Laplace of a sum or difference is just simply the difference of the Laplace. And then the Fourier follows the same rule of Laplace. So we can say that y of omega is equal to 1 over j omega plus 2 minus 1 over j omega plus 3. Uh, x of omega, x of t, we can follow the same idea and say that x of omega is equal to 1 over j omega plus 2. So now that we have found what x and uh, what y, so now that we have found what y and x is, we can find what h is. I'm going to do that on the next page. Alright, so here's where we left off. We had that y was equal to this, and then x, y of omega is equal to this, and x of omega is equal to this. And we know that um, uh, h of omega, our, uh, our stepping stone, because we know that h of omega is just simply equal to the Fourier transform of h of t. And h of t is what we want. And we can just simply say that the inverse Fourier transform of h of omega is equal to h of t, which is what we want. So all we have to solve for is what is y divided by x, and then take the inverse Fourier transform. So 1 over x, right here, so 1 over x of omega is simply 1 over 1 over, so just simply j omega plus 2. That means h of omega will be 1 over jw plus 2 minus over j omega plus 3, all that being multiplied by j omega plus 2. So then this is just equal to 1, because it's j omega plus 2 divided by j omega plus 2, minus j omega plus 2 over j omega plus 3. And what we could do is we can just simply add 1 to this guy right here. We just say add 1. But because we add 1 so we don't mess up our equation, we need to either add 1 to the other side, or we can just subtract 1, because 1 minus 1 is 0, so we do nothing different to the equation. But what comes out is rather nice, because we have 1 minus j omega plus 3 divided by j omega plus 3. So minus 1 minus a minus, you got to make sure you distribute your minus carefully, so it becomes plus 1 over j omega plus 3. So they cancel out, and we can say that h of omega is equal to 1 over j 
omega plus 3. And if we look back at y omega, that was just uh, the that is just the Laplace of e to the negative 3t. So if we take the inverse Laplace of our h of omega we have now, we have that h of t is equal to e to negative 3t u of t. And that is our impulse response. And now we have to find what the magnitude and the angle graphs. So I'm going to go to the next page and I'm going to write what our, uh, I'm going to rewrite this guy so then we can save him when we ever, whenever we're finding for the magnitude. So here we are. We have h of omega is equal to 1 over j omega plus 3. Now in order to take the magnitude of a function, of a complex function, the magnitude of a complex fun function is just the square root of the function times its conjugate. And just so then you can remember, the conjugate of a function is just anywhere where you see a, uh, a complex number, so j omega, you just simply take the negative of it. So the conjugate of this function would be 1 over negative j omega plus 3, not minus 3, plus 3. So we get that the magnitude of h of omega is equal to the square root of 1 over j omega plus 3 times 1 over negative j omega plus 3. Now if you work out this uh, multiplication, this this polynomial, 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 this poly, now if you work out this polynomial uh, multiplication, you will find that it's equal to the square root of 1 over Technically, it's negative j omega squared, so just j omega, sorry, it's just omega squared plus 9, which is 3 squared, because the inside terms will cancel each other out, and the outside term would be negative j squared, which is just positive 1. Now, the, uh, the square root of a fraction is just the quotient of the square roots. So this is the square root of 1 divided by the square root. This is just simply... 1 over the square root of omega squared plus 9, which is equal to the magnitude of omega. So let's graph this. Now let's consider what h of omega at 0 would look like. h of omega at 0 would just be 1 over z the square root of 0 squared, so 0, plus 9. So the square root of 9, which is 3. So this is 1 over 3. So we're going to put that on a letter thing. This is equal to 1 third. Now as omega increases, either in the positive or negative direction, it will always be a positive value. So slowly, our numerator, or our denominator, will increase. This will appear to look something of the nature of this. Sorry, that's supposed to be right there at one third. It should look like a little hump and slowly uh, tapers off as it goes to positive and negative omega. So that's about what our graph should look like. So let's now go in uh, to figure out what the phase of this function would be. So here's the function that we left off with is that h omega is equal to 1 over j omega plus 3. That doesn't help us much when we're trying to find the uh, the uh, the the angle, because by definition, the angle is the tan inverse of your imaginary terms divided by your real terms. And this is just the, uh, just the um, co uh, coefficients. So we shouldn't have any j's in the numerator. We should just have reals, or real values, rather. We can have omegas, and those are fine, because omega is technically a real value. It's a value we're plugging into this function. Now, I'm not exactly sure how to come to this conclusion. However, when I always look for what is the phase of what 1 over j omega plus 3 is, it is always the negative of the coefficients of j, so this will be negative omega, divided by whatever that value that we are adding to it. 
I don't understand why this guy always ends up in this, but this is what the phase of e to the e to the negative a is. Is that the phase of e to the negative a t is always equal to is always equal to ten. This is a phase. Phase is ten minus one of negative omega divided by a. Not exactly sure why, but this is how it always turns out. So we can figure out that the tan inverse of our function will be negative omega over 3. Which, as we can see, that this is just going to be the negative tan. So as omega increases, I'll, uh, I'll graph it now. Omega, and this will be phase. This should be, these should be uh, pi over 2. This should be negative pi over 2. That as omega increases, where it should be the negative values. And as pi decreases, we should be the positive values of phase. And that should line up with 0, sorry. And that's how we solve the, uh, that's how we solve for the magnitude and the phase of a, of a input-output, uh, an input-output pair. Thank you for watching.